Oops. We're kind of getting towards the end of the Sins of the Heart series. It, and as it stands now, it, it's today and next week. And, and we've, we've studied some particular sins. I hope they've been enlightening to you. I hope that you've kind of helped you travel down a path. We're not going to try to name as many as we can and talk about as many as we can because the pathway is all the same. Uh, it starts with uh, a lie from Satan where he takes something God has given us, twists it a little bit, adds something to it, takes something away, presents it to us, our deceitful heart embraces it, uh, sometimes without even being aware, and, and then we start making decisions and choices and adapting our thinking so that we start living out that lie, and, and then it progresses. And today we're going to talk about that progression. So the, the title of the sermon is Long-Term Results of Sin Orig Originating in the Heart. It's a long, awkward title, but it seems to be how it's going to work. I don't know if you can hear the phone going off. There we go. So, so we're going to kind of take the long, the long approach today. We're not going to talk out about a specific sin. We're going to talk about all of them, and we're going to see where it takes us from a particular passage. Um, before we get too far down that road, let's, let's do some review. It's in your notes. Uh, here's number one. Satan's lies, our heart's deception, and the sins of the heart, if unchecked, will increase in frequency, intensity, and negative effect over time. I think we've, we've made that point pretty clear. If unchecked, and that's the key. That's the whole point of the sermon is to check our hearts, check the way we're thinking, check the behaviors that are coming out, see if they're in line with God's words. If they're not, figure out what lie we're listening to and, and stop listening. But unchecked, uh, sin increases, the, the effect of it increases. We become more selfish, more prideful. We, we may become depressed as a result, and, and we definitely move farther from God. And when we move farther from God, that affects us spiritually, physically, and mentally. So that's something we want to avoid. Number two, a non-believer will become more and more trapped in this network of temptation. That's what we call Satan's lies. He doesn't give us one or two lies. He gives us a multitude of lies, hoping to catch us on one or two or ten of them so that he can start to manipulate us. And it's a, a network of temptation. And the non-believer that doesn't have the Holy Spirit, that's not studying the Bible, that doesn't have information about the promises and all these things in, it, in their heart and mind, they just become more and more trapped. And, and that's why we have to share the gospel and be very clear and pray for them. They're not just going to come out of it on their own. They're not going to grow out of their sinful nature and become a Christian as they mature in life. It's just going to grab them and it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep them more and more. So we have to be proactive in sharing our faith. Number three... A believer will exercise weakness in faith, decreased joy, peace, and hope, and a disconnect from God. So a believer is susceptible to the lies as well. We still have a sinful nature that we fight. We still have a deceitful heart that hasn't been fixed. We are a new creation, and we have the Holy Spirit, so we have a lot going for us, but we're still fighting battles. And if we believe the lies and we start living according to them, our faith will be weak and we'll be disconnected from God. Now, you might say, why would God let this happen? And I'm, I'm going to say for the first time that when this happens, it's actually a blessing in your life because it should get your attention. When, when you're not at peace and you don't have joy and you don't feel like you have faith and you don't feel like God's hearing your prayers, that should drive you back to say, why is this happening? How am I becoming disconnected from God? And hopefully you can identify some of these things. It, it's like when the doctor says, well, I noticed this and we need to take care of it. And you say, well, I actually feel fine. And the doctor says, yeah, you feel fine now, but if we don't take care of this, it's, it's going to bring about you know, a heart attack, a stroke, a loss of a limb, something like this. So we take care of it early. That's, that's the idea there. Number four, the answer in both situations whether you're saved or unsaved, listening to these lies, the answer in both situations is to either establish or reestablish an active and healthy relationship with God. Active and healthy. Remember that seeking the kingdom of God. 
being in our Bibles, being involved in prayer, uh, being proactive about gaining knowledge from God, from Scripture, uh, being involved in ministry. It's active and healthy relationships. So uh, an unbeliever needs to begin a relationship. And believers often need to kind of reestablish, kind of check our heart, kind of say, God, I've, I've wondered a little bit. I'm back on track. Keep me where I need to be. So it's establish or reestablish. And we're going to spend probably all of next week talking about that establishing and reestablishing a relationship because that would be the ultimate answer. And we're still kind of focused on the negative pathway. So today's topic is the long-term results of sin originating in the heart. And we're going to follow the pathway of sin and view its earthly destination. So these sins are not just Satan going, hey, I'll try this, I'll try that. He has a plan and he has a purpose. And he has a destination he wants you to get to. And he's going to work hard. And, and we're going to work equally hard not to follow, not to listen, not to go there, and to save as many people from that path as possible. So we need to know where it ends up. Knowing where it ends up might give us the motivation to take steps now not to follow that pathway. So uh, find Romans chapter 1 in your Bible if you're not there already. Romans chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 18. In your notes, it says read and discuss, and that's exactly what we're going to do. I'm going to read it, and I'm going to make several stops along the way and discuss a few things. Then we'll come back to our notes. So right now, all you need is your Bible. And it, any Bible works. The one in the pew, the one you brought with you, the one on your phone, they're all good. So Romans 1.18 says, <clears throat> excuse me, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So there's a statement. We're going to come back to that in our notes. The wrath of God is being revealed against who? The godless and the wicked who suppress the truth. Verse 19, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. What has been known to God that's been made plain to them? Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. There's kind of two things to highlight there. What has been made known about God is plain to them. Well, there's some things that have been made known to man and are plain that aren't listed here. Uh, our conscience is one. Every human being is born with an internal gauge of right and wrong. Every culture has a very similar, if not exact, list of things that people aren't allowed to do in their culture, in their society. That comes from God implanting it into our conscience. There's an unseen evidence of God. The fact that we know right and wrong is an unseen evidence of God. The, uh, the absolute truths that exist. Uh, then we look at creation, and it says, for since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So we look at the, the world that's made, and we notice the trees and, and how they work. We notice the human body and how it works. We notice the weather system. We look at the solar system. We see in creation a, an infinite amount of knowledge being displayed and an infinite amount of power being displayed, and we conclude there's a God. When I was thinking about this, I remember... Uh, a couple of years ago at our church picnic, when I asked Ashley to share about camp when she was working at camp, and she told the story of some Chinese girls who were touring America. They were just touring America. Uh, they wanted to see the mountains. They wanted to see the lakes. They wanted to see the cities, and they wanted to experience summer camp. And for whatever reason, Trout Creek Bible Camp became the place that their tour group sent them to summer camp. So they came to summer camp with their adult chaperones. They kind of had their own cabins and whatnot. And, and one evening, their counselor took them out to the field to lay in the grass and look at the stars. And because they could look into the clear Oregon skies and see the stars, one of them realized those stars prove there's a God. And she had been taught her whole life there was no God. She had this realization that God exists, started asking questions, got saved, 
two or three others got saved, and one of them, the same one, the first one that got saved, said, my, my life's goal now is to go home and share Jesus with, with my friends and my family. And it was because she looked at the stars and saw the vastness of creation and said, wow, there must be a God. I've been told my whole life there's no God. There's definitely a God. That's the eternal power and the divine nature that is clearly seen being understood by what is made so that people are without excuse. If you can, if you can see nature, you can see God. If you can know right and wrong, you can see God. If you have a conscience, you can feel God. The knowledge of God is imprinted in everybody. That's an important thing to notice here. Continuing in verse 21, for although they knew God, not, not that they might have known God or should have known God, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is the, the very reason that we start Sunday school for the adults with, where has God blessed you? Where has God answered prayer? Where have you seen God at work? And we take as much time as necessary to hear every report because we want to glorify God and we want to give thanks. Because if we don't do those things, then we get a little bit more disconnected than we should be. We do it in youth group, and we do it on Wednesday nights with the men. I don't know if they do it with the women or not. But we intentionally look for the areas where we glorify God, look for the areas where we give thanks, identify them out loud, and then do that. So that our, our thinking does not become futile. It says, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Futile means worthless. Their, their thinking became unproductive. It, become, it became unvaluable. It, it became foolish. Verse 22, although they claim to be wise, that should, well, let's let that sink in for a minute. Although they claim to be wise, they became fools. I, I don't know how many times every person I hear speak on the internet, on Facebook, on the TV is absolutely sure they're correct. Absolutely, beyond the shadow of a doubt, they're sharing wisdom beyond the rest. They claim to be wise. Half of them or three quarters of them or 90% of them or more are sharing foolishness. Uh, not connected with God or his, or his truth. Verse 23, or verse 22 again, although they claim to be wise, they, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the or, immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Now this is written to the Romans, and, and their idols were human beings, birds, animals, and reptiles. Uh, it was the Caesar or someone before, and, and they had actual idols. Well, we don't typically have idols laying around. We don't typically uh, melt our gold and make an idol. We have idols of the heart. That's why we talked about that earlier. Verse 24, therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. There's Satan's lie right there. Exchange the truth. I want to stop and what does exchange mean? It means they knew the truth and they heard the lie and they chose the lie. The lie was more appealing. The, the lie gave them what they wanted. So they exchanged the truth of God. They made a transaction. We're going to walk away from the truth of God and we're going to embrace this lie. And they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Verse 26. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even the women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. It's an interesting phrase there, even the women. And you might say, why would they say even the women? What Paul's alluding to is that the, the women are usually the last ones to fall into the sin. They have more to lose. They're thinking of their families. Their minds connect every relationship together. You know, men categorize. And a, a man can sin here on Monday and then on Tuesday not think about it. Women, it's, it's, all, it's all together. It's that spaghetti brain, if you will. And it's, it's how's this going to affect the children? How's this going to affect the family? How's it going to affect my friends? And so the women are usually, they hold back longer, and they're the last ones. And it says, even the women have exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. It's like it's progressed that far. 
In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty of their error. They received in themselves the due penalty. Well, what's that? Well, you're not supposed to say it's AIDS, but it's AIDS. You're not supposed to say it's sexually transmitted diseases, but it is. You're not supposed to say depression, but it is. You're not supposed to say doubt, uncertainty, uh, unhappiness, lack of joy, uh, missing out on peace. You're not supposed to say those things because that's politically incorrect, but that is the due penalty. Sin always leads down those roads. Uh, sin will bring about depression. Sin will steal your joy. Sin will steal your peace. Sin will disconnect you from the important relationships in your life. Sin will take you down there. And sexual sin has an added penalty in the body. It's right there in Scripture. That's the warning. That's God saying, hey, listen up. This is a preliminary warning. You're starting to experience this stuff. You better check what's happening. Why is this, why is this occurring? So it's actually, these penalties are uh, kind of an attention getter. They can be even a blessing if they get the right response. Verse 28, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain their knowledge of God, like now they're not even going to remember it. I knew it. I chose not to go with it. Now I'm going to forget about it. They didn't choose to retain the knowledge of God. So God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they would, so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled, like it, it's, it's everywhere, filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. Interesting that that's in the list here. Disobeying parents is important to God. It's important to God to honor your parents. Verse 31, they have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, spiritual death, they know. That's why mankind fears death. That's why they fear the unknown, because they know they're not following God. That's why believers can overcome that fear. And can even say, man, I'm ready. Whenever God wants me, I'm ready. They do, excuse me, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. And I hope that you're seeing the parallels of our own society in these scriptures. I hope, I hope you're saying, wow, this is so similar. Because aren't we right there at the last verse? Aren't we being asked to approve of all these deviant behaviors? all these sinful behaviors. So this is the progression of sin when the sin of the heart takes over the life. This is, this is where we end up at. Let's go to our notes and let's talk about that progression. So number one in your notes is, the first thing I want you to notice is the progression of both sin and judgment in this passage. Sin is progressing, judgment is also progressing. In verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed. That means it's already being revealed, it's still being revealed, and it will continue to be revealed. So, you know, as we think about the United States of America, and we think about, is, is God judging us? Well, certainly he is. He, there will always be a level of judgment. The, the judgment can increase or decrease depending on our beliefs and our behavior. But here, the wrath of God is being revealed. Paul's saying, the wrath of God is already being revealed to some, to a lesser degree, to some, to the degree described, and to others, it's further along. So you might say to yourself, well, I'm not progressing this far. Thank goodness. You might say, well, actually, I am. I need to check myself. Others might be way to the end. It's not that everyone's on the same path at the same spot, but the path is there, and that's why we need to watch out for it. So verse 18, the wrath is being revealed. Verse 21, their thinking became futile. It became, it wasn't foolish, but it became that because of their choices and decisions and what they choose to believe. Uh, verse 23, they exchanged, they made that transaction. I, I, know, I know right and I know wrong. Wrong looks like a lot more fun. The devil's telling me it's not really that wrong and it's not really going to cause that bad of a consequence. 
I think I'm willing to risk it. The devil says, hey, here's a shortcut to where you want to be. Okay, I'll try the shortcut. We exchange the truth of God for a lie. Verse 27, the men abandoned. Of course, the women did too, but the men abandoned. They gave up what was natural. They gave up what they knew was right. And then verse 24, we see God's judgment. Therefore, God gave them over. It's also verse 26. It's also verse 28. As sin increased, God gave them over. Verse 29, they became filled, or they have become filled. And verse 32, they not only continue to do such things, but also, so it, it's still continuing. The but also is that they approve of those who practice them. So in each step along the way, the sin increases and the judgment increases. Okay? Uh, number two, notice this. Uh, in our sermon series, several of the topics we discussed are listed here. Greed, selfishness, envy, arrogant, boastful, that's pride. Some of the indirect topics, the things that came about from our discussion, evil, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slander, no love, no mercy. These are things listed in our passage in verse 29 through 31. And these are topics that came up as we studied selfishness and pride and idolatry and, and covetousness and these things. So I just want you to notice that the connection is here. I'm not just pulling this out of the air. Number three, notice that we, as in you and I, as in the United States of America, we are seeing the same progression of sin and its effects today. And I want to run through this. You have in your notes the progression listed in Scripture. I want to identify some of the progression in our culture. So in verse 18, it says we suppress the truth. We, we might call that intolerance, where we're not allowed to say anything's wrong. If we do, we're intolerant. You know, you can say or believe anything you want as long as what you say or believe doesn't infringe on someone else's say or belief. Intolerance. Political correctness. Political correctness is, is so not an issue anymore because other issues have surmounted it. But political correctness is, you know, the inability to talk in plain truth because it's, it's not kind, it's not loving, it's not accepting, this kind of stuff. Um, today we have the cance canceling culture. I don't know if you're aware of this, but they've given it a term where if, if you say something about someone and people decide they don't like it, they, they cancel you. So if you're in the entertainment industry, they'll try to cancel you out of the industry. Don't buy their records. Don't keep them on. And, and there's been Christian actors and Christian musicians who have stepped out and said, hey, abortion's wrong. Hey, um, this is wrong. That's wrong. This BLM platform is wrong. And, and they're, they're being canceled, put out of business. There's businesses that have been put out of business because they hold to uh, a Christian standard or because they have uh, Christian ideals. Um, just a simple thing. We have... The Washington Redskins are, are no longer to be called the Washington Redskins. They're, they're, they're being canceled. They were told, change your name or lose your stadium, lose your city. Um, some of their owners said, change the name or lose our money. They were canceled. There's been other national businesses. They tried to cancel uh, that, um, that food company. Yeah, Boya Foods, they tried to cancel them, and they were big enough to say no, and, and, and people rallied around them. There's a cancel culture. It's the truth is suppressed. You're not allowed to say the truth. And if you are, I mean, I've had things, I know Margie has too, I've had things that have been taken off of Facebook as unfactual, when really the only offense is that it didn't match their opinion. And it's been taken down. I, I've been posting as many scriptures as I can lately, because I'm just trying to redeem Facebook a little bit. And I've seen a lot of you doing that too. And I just wonder how long before that's offensive, before that gets taken down. But that's suppressing the truth. In verse 21, it says, God is not glorified or given thanks. Just one example. Uh, evolution is, is falling, it's falling by the wayside because the origin story can't be supported. It can't, it can't be built upon. And, and so the origin story of the Big Bang and all that, it, it, they have to have another answer. Like the upper echelons 
of science is, is saying, well, okay, we have to admit this doesn't work. What's left? Well, we raise our hand and we say, well, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the starting point. And they go, no, 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 that can't be it. And we've eliminated that a long time ago. So what they're saying now is that aliens seeded our planet with life and intelligence. So these benevolent aliens out of their own good nature gave us life for no benefit of their own because they haven't come back for any benefit and apparently uh, just to be nice. And, and so that's the answer because we, we can't glorify God with giving him credit and we can't thank him for something we don't give him credit for. That's going on today. Verse 21, for, follow on, their thinking became futile. Think of all the worldviews that we've talked about over the course of time. Uh, all the cults we've talked about where um, crazy things have turned into religion. Um, one of them, actually a, 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 a fictional novel, became their Bible. And now they believe this stuff that was written for fiction. And it's their thing now. Um, think of all the parenting schemes that have tried to replace biblical parenting that don't work. Um, politics. There's some futile thinking, perhaps. Um, verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools. The, the same examples, science, evolution, parenting. This is how you're going to turn, this is how we're going to make our kids great. Let them make all the decisions. That's the new thing. They don't want to wear a diaper, don't make them wear a diaper. They don't want to eat, don't make them eat. Feed them when they're hungry. Feed them what they want to eat. Let them go where they want to go. Let them do what they want to do. You're here to serve them. We don't want to stifle their creativity. We don't want to get in the way of them becoming who they're supposed to be. We're going to, we're going to do everything they want, and we're going to do it the way they want. We are at their beck and call. A parenting idea does not work, by the way. In case you just don't even think about it. It's not, it's not going to work. But that's the futile thinking. Now, they claim to be wise. They became fools. Uh, verse 23, it mentions idolatry. I think it's really interesting that a lot of the sports aren't happening right now. There's nobody out of baseball game to watch the game. I haven't heard a thing about football. I don't know what they're doing. Uh, sports are being canceled. I almost wonder if God's going, you know what, I'm sick of this idol you call sports. I'm going to knock it off its shelf a little bit. And, and, you know, we all know sports aren't bad in and of themselves, but some of the attitudes that go along with it can be idolatry. I just wonder if God's going, well, let me give you other things to think about. I was talking, we, were, we had a little meeting about Awanas. And we are like, what are we, we going to do about Awanas? And it's like, well, let's modify it so that we can do it because there's nothing competing with it right now. There is no after-school sports program. There's no competition. Let's take advantage of this. Let's focus on God's word here. Um, idolatry of politics. Man, I swear, if one of the politicians said, I'm the Messiah, half their supporters would go, yes, finally. I knew it all along. Idolatry. Verse 24, sexual impurity and the degrading of their bodies. Well, the sexual revolution was the 60s and 70s, and it's just continued on. Uh, there's some really weird and crazy stuff out there. You hear it on the news. Right now in Massachusetts, they... In a city in Massachusetts, they just gave uh, husband-wife rights to groups of people that are married together. Um, I don't know, I remember what the word is for it, but it, it's not polygamy because it's not. No, but there, there's a there's a word, and then and then polygamy is on its way back, and uh, pedophilia is on its way in, because how can we deny someone's natural desires? that they were born with. All this stuff's going on. Sexual impurity, degrading of the bodies. Um, verse 25, they worship false gods. We've talked about that. Uh, we can throw in musicians and actors, uh, possessions, jobs, that kind of stuff, all false gods. Verse 26 and 27, we have the homosexual lifestyle. Um, you know, just, just go public and say something against them, see what happens. Uh, it, we're not only supposed to let it happen, we're supposed to cheer them on. We need to be at their parade. And, and we, we should actually be taking part in the parade. Uh, we should be giving them jobs and all these things. That's what the world says. It's that homosexual lifestyle. It's, you know, it's enough there. Verse 28, God was forgotten. 
there are actually, and this is mind-boggling, there are actually people that I run into who don't know any of the commandments. They've never read or held a Bible in their hand. They don't know who Jesus was. They have no historicity from Scripture. I, I, you have to explain everything. You have to start with Adam and Eve. Well, I've heard of them. What are they, who are they supposed to be? I mean, you have to go back. They, they literally have forgotten who God is. Forgotten that there is a God, you know, probably because they've been told there is no God. Verse 29 through 31, sin became rampant, open, and consuming. It became normal. Sin is normal. So we have the whole homosexual thing where it's normal. They're born this way. We're not arguing about genes anymore. We're not arguing about, you know, it's just normal. It's just part of life. We accept these things. Abortion, normal, part of life. How dare you? Tell me that I can't have an abortion when I want to. I'm going to scream and holler at you. I'm going to get all my friends to scream and holler at you. I'm going to make an issue of this. If you're pro-life, you know, you're a, you're a bad person. Talked about the, the pedophiles, talked about the weird marriages. Um, sin is rampant. It's open, it's consuming, it's, it's normal. You know, there was a day when if, if a couple started living together before they were married, that would turn heads. Now, that's, a, that's considered a normal progression in the relationship. Like, we kissed. You know, there was a day when a couple sleeping together before they were married would turn heads. That's just another step in the progression of relationship. We meet, we have sex, we start living together. And one day, maybe, if it works out for us economically or maybe for the insurance or something, we'll go ahead and get married. But that's not super important. That's, that's normal. Those are lies of Satan progressing in society so that people are following them, and they have no idea they're listening to a lie. This is all happening today. Verse 32, people who sin are approved of by society and, and individuals. is said in there, and I, I didn't, but they invent ways of doing evil. I think one of the inventions is that they take the sin that they approve of, and now they're forcing others to approve of it. This is all going on today. Isn't it interesting that we can read a letter written to the Roman city of Rome in the first century, and we can see the exact same things they were dealing with being dealt with right now? Number four in your notes, notice that God's wrath was simply allowing man to do what he wanted to do. This is how God's wrath was applied here. He said, you want to do this? Well, I'm not going to force you to listen. I'm not going to force you to obey. I'm not going to force you to follow. You go ahead. I'll step back. I'll be here when you're ready to call out to me. I'll be here waiting. And they continued on, and they had less interest in God. And he said, okay, you, you have less interest? Go ahead. He just kept saying, go ahead, go ahead. Pretty soon they're so far away. They have no clue there's a God watching who's ready to step in, who's ready to forgive their sin, who's ready to welcome them into his family. I think probably the worst judgment we can receive on this earth is God saying, if that's what you want, go ahead and do it. Because we just keep going. So it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a pretty harsh judgment. If, if he had come in like Sodom and Gomorrah, he might have saved a bunch of people, got their attention. If he sent a prophet like Jonah, that he sent to Nineveh, they might have repented. But God let them have what they wanted. He already had a relationship with them. He was already interacting, and they chose to walk the other way. Number five, notice that God did give warnings. He gave them um, the due penalty of their error in verse 27. He gave them Paul to preach, and he gave them Christianity to observe. He gave them examples, he gave them warnings, he gave them opportunities. He didn't just step out, he still gave them opportunities. And number six, remember that this eventually led to the fall of Rome. Okay, And you can check this out in, in history. Uh, they determined what went wrong with Rome. It was the decline of the family and the moral decline that brought them down as a, a civilization. But... God was neither stopped nor slowed by the collapse of Rome or the empire. It didn't slow God down. It didn't stop God. God did not go, 
man, these Romans blew it. Now what am I going to do? They were my ticket. God said, I knew this was going to happen. I knew it was going to be there. I have made plans. I have, I have all the answers I need. This is good. I, I'm still in control. It didn't stop and it didn't slow down. And if America does not respond, and if our country does not respond, and if we are judged, maybe even to the point where we are no longer a nation or no longer a viable nation, we're no longer a nation that matters. It will not slow God down, and it will not stop his work. We need to understand that we are citizens of God's kingdom first, citizens of the United States second. We need to understand that, that we are not so great that God needs us. And we are not so great that our collapse will ruin God's plans. He can work with us or he can work without us. I certainly hope that he works with us. That's the side I want to be on. Okay? He's not going to be stopped and he's not going to be slowed down. What's the application? What are you supposed to leave with? What are you supposed to do? Are you just supposed to leave with, oh, we're doomed. This is terrible. No. Application number one. Do not be part of the cultural decline into deeper levels of sin and disgrace. Just don't go along with the program. Don't be a part of the decline. Say enough is enough. I stop right here. Matter of fact, I'm going to reevaluate and take a few steps back. I'm going to live the way God wants me to live, no matter what my neighbors are doing, no matter what my state is doing, no matter what my nation is doing. I will stand up for what God says. I'll stand up for what I believe in. I will speak the truth in love and respect, but I will speak the truth. I will represent God. I'll be as ambassador. I'll be a light on a hill. I'll be the salt of the earth. I will do what God wants me to do. I'm not going to follow the path. Be that person. Say, I will not be a part of this. Okay? Second thing, finishing number one, we, you and I, may be the only thing holding off God's further wrath. There's some motivation. Have you not wondered how a nation can legislate and pay for the murder of so many babies, millions of babies a year, and God not judge us? Have you thought about that? How we can, we can follow this pathway to where we're at the end of the pathway. We're approving of evil and approving of those who practice and trying to force everyone else to approve. How are we not being judged more severely than we are? I think we are being judged. How are we not being more severely? The only answer I can come up with is that there is a force of people, Christians for the most part, who are actively pursuing the end of abortion in America, fighting against the sin. And I wonder, if we give up on that fight, is God going to stop holding back the wrath. And that's a good reason to keep up the fight. Is it because there's believers in Christ who are trying to live correctly that the whole society is not being judged? I don't know. It's a possibility. All right? In Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, God worked a deal, and if there was five it finally got down to, he would spare the two cities. There weren't five, and he didn't spare the cities, but he would have. In Nineveh, he sent the prophet. They repented, and the city was not destroyed. So the opposite story. They listened to the prophet. They repented. The city was saved. And then we have Genesis 15, 16, where it mentions the sin of the Amorites. And God told Moses and the Israelites, well, don't destroy the Amorites yet. Their sin hasn't reached its full potential. In other words, they aren't sinning enough to require the penalty of being wiped off the face of the earth like the other nations had. I hope we never get there. But it's certainly something to think about. How do we stop that from happening? Don't be a part of it. Be a part of what God has for us. Number two, be like the hundred prophets of God hiding in a cave from Jezebel. You remember that part of the story? Obadiah has two caves with 50 prophets in each one hiding them from Jezebel, who's trying to kill them all. I, I, I think it's uh, Jeremiah. Is it Jeremiah? No, Elijah. 
off whining by himself. I'm the only one, God. No one's around. What are you doing? And Obadiah's got 100 of them saved. And then God says, you know what? I've got 600 people that haven't bowed the knee. And they're ready to serve me. So get back on the program, dude. Right? That's what he said to him. I quote. All right? But those 50 people left their homes, left their jobs, left their families, and were hiding in a cave so that they would not be forced to bow the knee or be killed. They were actually willing to hide in a cave rather than, rather than uh, worship somebody else. Or be like the martyrs of Revelation 6, 9 to 11, who would rather die than deny their newly found God. These were people that got saved in the tribulation and then were martyred because of that. They were killed because they were saved. They couldn't have been saved more than seven years because that's how long the tribulation lasts. You know, whether it's a matter of weeks or three to five years, when it came time, deny Christ and live? No, chop my head off. And they would rather die than deny Christ. And they were brand new believers. Be one of those people. And be like Joshua in Joshua 24 who said, you want to serve the gods of the people in the land we live? Go ahead. You want to serve the gods in Egypt where we came from? Go ahead. You want to make up your own gods? Go ahead. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Be Joshua and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How are we going to not let this progression take place? In our lives, we're going to pay attention. We're going to make corrections early on. We're going to nip it in the butt, if you will. And how are we going to change our culture? By being these people and by being the light to everyone else. How's it going to work out in the end? I don't know. I don't know how it's going to work out for the United States. I don't know how it's going to work out in a lot of ways. I do know that in the end, Jesus is coming back. There's going to be the tribulation. There's going to be the thousand-year reign of Christ. There's going to be the new heaven and the new earth. And I'm going to be there, and I'm hoping for an awesome job. They're all going to be good. And then we spend eternity with God. We don't lose. Let's fight a good fight along the way. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this passage being including, included here. Help us to hear the warnings. Help us to take precautions, make adjustments, and serve you well. Holy Spirit, you do the rest of the work. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.